Welcome friends, it's G Sap from Butterfly Garden. Today we're going to learn about something called kelp and the kelp forest, which is a habitat within the ocean. I have a story to read to you called The Golden Forest, exploring a coastal California ecosystem, written by Carol Blanchett and Jennifer Dugan, Illustrations by Michael Rothman. Welcome to California, Nico shouts. She throws her arms around her favorite cousin who has traveled all the way from the Rocky Mountains of Colorado to see her. Thanks, Owen says. I can't wait to get to the ocean. At the beach, Owen is in awe of the big blue ocean in front of him. Then suddenly he hears a loud splash. What was that, he shouts. Oh, that was just a pelican going fishing, says Nico. Pelicans look for fish from the air. When they see one, they dive straight down underneath the water and scoop it up with their large bills. Cool, Owen says, watching the big bird fly away with its prize. That evening, strong winds rattled the house. The skies darkened and rain beats against the window. Looks like a pretty big storm, says Nico's dad. You can hear the sound of the waves crashing into the beach all the way from here. This is the first big storm we've had since last winter, so the beach might look a little different tomorrow, comments Nico's mom. What do you mean, asks Owen. You'll see, says Nico. By morning, all is quiet. The sun has reappeared. Owen, Nico, and her mom stand out on the beach and notice how different it looks from the day before. Where did all the seaweed come from? asks Owen. That's kelp, answers Nico. It's a type of brown algae that grows in the ocean right out there. What's it doing on the beach? asks Owen. Nico's mom is a marine biologist who studies the plants and animals that live in the coastal regions of the ocean. The waves from the storm were so strong, they ripped it out of the ocean and carried it to the beach, she answers. Let's take a closer look. Although kelp looks like a plant, it belongs to a group of organisms called algae. Algae do not have true roots, stems, or leaves. Instead of roots, kelp has a branching structure called a holdfast that grows over rocks on the sea floor. Unlike roots, holdfasts do not take in nutrients. The main purpose of the holdfast is to keep the kelp from floating away. Rising up from the kelp's holdfast is a stem-like structure called a stipe. The stipe is strong and flexible. Flat, leaf-like blades grow out of the stipe. Blades use sunlight to make food for the kelp. They also absorb nutrients directly from the water. Kelp stipes and blades cannot stand up on their own. Gas-filled, ball-shaped floats called pneumatocysts pull the stipes and blades toward the sunlit surface. Nico and Owen spread out an entire kelp plant across the sand. This is longer than a school bus, says Owen. Kelp is one of the fastest growing species on earth, says Nico's mom. Where there's cool, nutrient-rich ocean, kelp can grow up to two feet per day. It grows in the shallow areas of the ocean because it relies on energy from the sun for photosynthesis. Imagine a forest of plants this long underwater, Nico says. I know a lot about forests in Colorado, says Owen, laughing, but nothing about underwater forests. Photosynthesis. Although kelp resemble land plants, they are uniquely adapted to life in cool, clear, moving water. Kelp blades obtain energy from sunlight and take up carbon dioxide from water. Kelp blades use water and the energy from the sun to convert carbon dioxide to sugars and release oxygen in the water in a process called photosynthesis. The pneumatocysts of the kelp help to hold the blades close to the ocean surface, close to the sunlight. Let's see if you two are as strong as the waves that tore up these kelp plants, Nico's mom says. Sure, let's try to pull them apart, says Owen. Each kelp plant is made up of many separate strings called stipes, says Nico's mom. Nico holds this end of the stipe and Owen, you grab
grab the other end. Now pull, yells Nico. They pull on the kelp until the stipe breaks and they tumble onto the sand. Let's try three stipes, says Nico. This time, no matter how hard they pull, they can't break all three. That settles it, says Nico's mom, chuckling. Ocean waves are stronger than you two. What happens after a storm when the waves tear out the kelp, asks Owen. Most storms only tear out some of the kelp, and that creates space for more light to reach the bottom, allowing algae and smaller kelp plants to grow. The kelp torn from the ocean after a storm is called wreck. It's an important source of food for all the animals that live in the sand on the beach. There are animals on the beach, exclaims Owen. Yes, Nico's mom scoops up some sand and shows Nico and Owen the small beach hoppers caught between her fingers. As Nico and Owen look around, they notice thousands of beach hoppers bouncing around on the fresh kelp on the beach. Wow, says Owen, there are so many. Yes says Nico's mom, and they do a very good job getting rid of the kelp. There's no way they could possibly eat all of this, says Owen. These small crustaceans look like little jumping shrimp. During the day, they burrow in damp sand, ideally the consistency of brown sugar, often clustered around kelp piles well above the reach of the waves. At night, they come out of their burrows to find their favorite food, fresh kelp. To follow the tides and kelp, they have to make a new burrow every day. The pictured robe beetle is a colorful beetle that lives on the sandy beach and has lost the ability to fly. Pictured robe beetles hide in the kelp rack all day and come out from under the kelp rack at night to catch the beach hoppers. The ophiliid worm is a bright red worm that lives in the middle zone of the beach where it eats the sand as it burrows, a lot like the way an earthworm eats dirt in your garden. The worm then feeds on many small particles of kelp and ocean plankton that are trapped in the beach sand. And the sand crab, these are egg-shaped crabs that have no claws and don't eat kelp. Instead, they gather in groups in the wave wash where they use their feathery antenna to sieve microscopic food like plankton from the waves. To find them, look for the little V marks of their antennae in the wet sand. Sand crabs can quickly burrow backwards into the wet sand to avoid hungry birds and fish. I have an idea, says Nico. Let's do an experiment to find out how much rack these little guys can actually eat. She finds a stipe with several blades and pulls it away from the pile. Let's lay out all the kelp blades flat on the sand. Then we can come back later, find the same spot, and see how much rack is left, she says. Owen marks the location of their experiment with a shell and some driftwood so they can be sure to find it the next day. The next morning, Nico's mom opens up a big backpack filled with snorkeling, snorkeling gear. Let's get out into the water. Nico and Owen put on their masks, fins, and snorkels. The water here is pretty chilly, Nico says, but the cool temperature is good for the kelp. And where there is kelp, there are usually lots of other animals to see. I know you are both very good swimmers, says Nico's mom, but stay close to me as we swim into the ocean. Nico and Owen agree as they slide their feet into the fins. Snorkeling is a way to observe organisms underwater while breathing through a tube called a snorkel. Snorkeling in the cool waters off the coast of California typically requires a wetsuit, which is an outfit made out of neoprene that provides both thermal insulation and buoyancy. A diving mask is very important to provide visibility underwater. Fins, which are worn on the feet, provide more surface area for kicking and aid the movement through the water. The snorkel is the breathing tube, which provides a way to look underwater and breathe air at the same time. So snorkeling gear include the mask, the fin, and the snorkel. The ocean bottom is full of life and color. A red spiny lobster pokes its antennae out from underneath a rock. Pink coralline algae, red algae, and green surf grass 
cover much of the bottom surface in between the algae, the snorkelers see purple and red urchins and colorful sea stars, as well as crabs, sea cucumbers, and many more animals they have never seen before. Just beyond the surf grass, a golden forest of kelp comes into view. The water near the kelp is deeper, so the swimmers kick with their fins to get closer to the bottom. They are surrounded by towers of golden kelp. Sunlight streams between the stipes and darting in and around the kelp are small golden fish called senoritas. Several rockfish stay close to the kelp, bobbing up and down with each passing wave. Below them, a small leopard shark swims around, looking for crabs to eat. They catch glimpses of sea lions playing hide and seek in the golden forest. When they return to the beach, Nico and Owen cannot stop talking about how many new and different creatures they saw. Do you think all those creatures would be there without the kelp? asks Owen. Probably not as many, says Nico's mom. The kelp forest provides a protective habitat for animals that might be more easily found and eaten by predators without a good place to hide. The algae within the kelp forest also provides food for animals called grazers, such as urchins, snails, and abalones. Just like rack provides food for the beach hoppers, adds Nico. Hey, let's go check on our experiment. Nico and Owen race over to the shell and piece of driftwood marking the kelp they laid out on the beach the day before. Wow, exclaims Owen, it's almost gone. All that's left is part of the stipe. And look at all those beach hopper burrows where the blades of kelp used to be. The final day of Owen's stay, he and Nico head down to the beach one last time. All of the kelp that had washed up on the beach has disappeared. The cousins build a sandcastle on the edge of the water. Owen looks out at the rolling ocean and pictures a forest of golden kelp swaying gently in the water and all of the animals that live there. He realizes, in many ways, the underwater kelp forest is like the forest in his home state of Colorado. He places a shell at the top of the castle and smiles. Wow, I hope you learned as much as I did about the kelp forest. And next time you go to the beach, you can see some kelp that may be washed up on the sand. And you can look for some of the little critters that we talked about today, trying to eat the kelp. A couple things about going to the beach. One, if you see any litter, any trash, Ask your parents first, and if it's safe to do so, pick it up and throw it in one of the local garbage bins on the sand. And remember to leave the beach cleaner than when you came. So that means pick up all your scraps of food or wrappers that you may have um, consumed while you're enjoying the beach. If you try your best to keep the ocean clean, the animals will be happy that make the ocean their home. Thank you for joining us. Come back again soon.